Fermentation, we hear about this term everywhere when we talk about pizza. But what is that exactly? What are the impacts on the dough and how can we control it? Hi, my name is Sergio. I'm a professional pizza trainer here in France. And in this video, I will talk to you about fermentation in order to understand better this process, to understand what's involved and the impacts on the dough. So the fermentation is a chemical process that involves our yeast, or in particular the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's the fungus that is used in the normal yeast. And so what the yeast does basically during its fermentation, or also called alcoholic fermentation, that it takes the simple sugars that are available in the dough, fructose and glucose, and it will give us three main products, carbon dioxide, ethanol, and other organic acids. So this is the basic principle of a fermentation. It's a chemical reaction that involves yeast and will give us those products. We will see later on in this video the importance of those products for our dough. It's worth mentioning here that those simple sugars, okay, that are available in the dough are not there yet from the beginning. But it, there is another process that helps the yeast access to those simple sugar, and that's the maturation. So we use this term uh, in recent times to really indicate all the enzymatic reaction that take place in the dough. We have the amylases enzymes, which are the main responsible to decompose some of the more complex um, sugars, starch in general. And then we have other enzymes that take place one after the other to allow yeast to access fructose and glucose. Those are maltases and invertases. So when we look at the fermentation process, we look at the very big chemical process that takes place during our resting time for our dough and that will impact our dough in the way that we'll see in a minute. As we know, yeast activity is impacted by temperature. So we will see later on that temperature is one of the control variables, but here we're going to see how the yeast activity changes with temperature. So let's start with uh, what happens below four degrees. Below 4 degrees, so a cold temperature, we have a very limited yeast activity. And by the way, this limited activity is true for all microorganisms that are in the, in the dough, so also bacteria, enzymes. Once we go above 4 degrees and below 35 degrees, here the activity of the yeast increases proportionally to the temperature. In other words, the warmer the temperature of the dough, the higher the activity of the yeast, and so the higher the intensity of the fermentation. After 35 degrees and up to 50 degrees, we have a reduction in the activity of the yeast, and then we get to around 55 to 60 degrees, and that's when we are in the baking stage, we have the death of the yeast cell. For the fermentation, we will, of course, focus in this area, in this range, between 4 and 35 degrees. This is generally either the room temperature or a cold fermentation in the fridge, which is usually between four and six degrees. But in any case, this here is the range for our dough fermentation. When we look at the impacts of fermentation on our dough, we need to focus on the results of the fermentation. We've seen earlier that fermentation gives us carbon dioxide, ethanol, and other organic acids. These three elements are impacting our dough on two levels. First of all, the flavor, and second, gluten elasticity. This is essential to understand because what really helps us to achieve the elasticity and the flavor in our dough depends essentially on the fermentation. So where does this link between those three elements and flavor and gluten elasticity come from? So first of all, uh, the gluten elasticity is impacted by not only the pH level of our dough, which is determined by the concentration of those acids here, but gluten elasticity is also impacted by the oxidation and it's the carbon dioxide here that will impact the oxidation of our dough. As regards flavor, there are many more elements that are involved. First of all, those organic acids and ethanol, but there are also other compounds that are released as part of the yeast metabolism, like esters, and even other products that will react during baking in order to increase the flavor of our dough. So a very intricate network of reactions that are in any case all linked to the fermentation process. Now that we've seen what are the impacts on the dough, we need to ask ourselves, where is it that the fermentation will impact exactly our dough? So here 
let's look at the fermentation stages. Those are the stages where effectively all of those concepts that we have analyzed right now take place. And so that's when we are changing the properties of Odo from a flavor and elasticity point of view. So first of all, we have in case of an indirect dough, the fermentation of our pre-fermented dough, whether it's a bigger or a poolish preparation, will have a proofing time during which we're gonna have fermentation, so yeast activity. And that yeast activity will impact uh, the, the elasticity and the flavor of our dough. Next, we have bulk fermentation, often by itself in a direct dough. Bulk fermentation will have an important role in gluten elasticity, but also in flavor improvement, especially if we're doing a direct dough and we don't have a pre-fermentation before that. As regards to final proofing, its impact is important on the gluten elasticity, but a bit less on the gluten flavor. So here are all those three fermentation stages and whether we're doing a direct or an indirect dough, those stages will have a different impact on our dough. Let's look at more into details on how those fermentation stages impact our gluten. But to better understand this relation between fermentation and gluten elasticity, we need to look at the elastic properties of gluten. And those are two, extensibility and tenacity. Extensibility is the elastic property of gluten to be easily stretched. On the other hand, tenacity can be measured as the strength, as the force of the gluten and its resistance to stretch. So basically, in a pizza dough, we always need to achieve a balance between extensibility and tenacity. This is the key concept where we talk about gluten elasticity. So what happens is that during those fermentation stages, this balance will change and it will change in the right direction if we correctly manage each of those stages. In particular, fermentation of the pre-fermented dough and bulk fermentation will impact tenacity. Final proofing, on the other hand, will impact extensibility. And so when we think about Neapolitan pizza, but in general, all dough, we need to make sure that we manage correctly each of those stages so that the gluten reaches the balance that we need for our final product. Fermentation and gluten are strongly connected together. Why is that? Because as we saw earlier, fermentation impacts gluten elasticity. So what we're saying is that the fermentation process as it creates carbon dioxide and other uh, chemical compounds that will impact the gluten elasticity. What's interesting to understand here is that gluten elasticity impacts on its own a number of important parameters in our final result. Stretching, lightness, cross development, all those parameters depend of course on the gluten elasticity. Depending on what kind of gluten we have and that balance between extensibility and tenacity, we'll have a dough that maybe it's easier, or harder to stretch, that will have a light crumb or have uh, maybe developed or not crust. Anyway, all of those parameters depend on the gluten elasticity. But what we saw just right now is that gluten elasticity depends on the fermentation process. So what I'm saying here, and that's really uh, one of the most important concepts to understand in this video, is that the fermentation process is what will impact all of those parameters. So the stretching properties of the dough will depend on the fermentation. How has the fermentation changed the gluten elasticity and what's the end result. So what's the acidity, for example, of our pre-fermented dough? Uh, what kind of bulk fermentation we have done? How long our final proofing was? So all these parameters will impact the stretch. Similarly, the fermentation process will impact, of course, the lightness, the crust development. And so in order to control those three uh, parameters in our final result, we need to focus on the fermentation process. And of course, in the next stage, when we're gonna look at the control variables, we'll understand more on what to act in order to achieve the right gluten elasticity. So what are the control variables, those variables that will allow us to manage and control the fermentation process? So first of all, the fermentation process will always be impacted by the dough temperature. And specifically here, I'm talking about the temperature at the end of kneading. Of course, the dough temperature will evolve and that will 
um, depend on our second control variables, the proofing temperature. But at the end of kneading, we have an important role to choose the right dough temperature so that the fermentation goes in the direction that we want. Let's make some real examples to better understand the impact of dough temperature. Let's say I'm preparing a pre-fermented dough, like a beaker, and that fermentation will happen in the fridge at four to six degrees. It's very important to choose the dough temperature at the end of the kneading process for my pre-fermented dough a bit higher than normal so that the fermentation can correctly start. That's a similar scenario if, for example, we're doing a bulk fermentation again at cold temperature. And so the dough temperature that we're choosing at the end of kneading will help us achieve a correct fermentation. In all those cases, the temperature of the dough at the end of kneading needs to be chosen according to our fermentation. And of course, um, during the rest of the proofing time, the proofing temperature will be the second control variables. The way we choose proofing temperature is to make sure that within the time that we've chosen for our recipe, our dough will complete the fermentation. And that can be true for pre-fermented dough, bulk fermentation or final proofing. Once we fix the time, which is dictated by our organization, we will choose accordingly the proofing temperature reminding ourselves the key equation that dictates the dough. The higher the proofing temperature, the shorter the fermentation time, because the more intense the fermentation will be. On the other hand, the lower the proofing temperature, so generally in the fridge at four to six degrees, the longer the proofing time, has the fermentation, it's less intense. And last but not least, we have the quantity of yeast. Of course, the more yeast we're gonna use in our recipe, the more important will, the fermentation will be. So generally, certain products that need a specific level of elasticity, like Neapolitan pizza, will use not a lot of yeast because we want to keep the fermentation under control throughout the recipe. So those are the three control variables that we can use in our recipe to keep the fermentation in the direction that we want. Let's now look at three examples of fermentation. We're going to look at the first two, which are examples of bad fermentation, where the control variables have not been uh, managed properly. And the third example will be a well-managed fermentation, which will give us a nice result. And all of those three examples are Neapolitan pizza. For the first example, we're looking at this Neapolitan pizza, realized with a direct dough. The major problem of this pizza is the short fermentation. The elasticity and the texture improvement to the dough that the fermentation brings didn't have the time to happen, as the fermentation was below 5 hours. The result is that the crust is quite dense and not very light. In this example, the bulk fermentation was too short to allow the dough to develop the elasticity to give us a light result. Another interesting aspect to analyze is the crust coloring. As you can see, the crust has an homogeneous coloring, sign that the amount of sugars was quite high, given that the fermentation consumed very little of them. The second example is again a Neapolitan pizza with an incorrect fermentation. As you can see, the dough is already quite elastic during stretching, and after baking, the pizza shrinked and exhibit a developed but very dense crust. These are all a sign of a gluten that has not enough extensibility due to the incorrect fermentation. In particular here, the final proofing, which is essential to bring extensibility to our dough, was too short for this kind of recipe. The final proofing time was in fact just over four hours, a room temperature of around 25 degrees. The last example is a Neapolitan pizza with a balanced fermentation. We have a dough that is very easy to stretch, showing good extensibility, and after baking, the pizza hasn't shrinked. And on the contrary, it shows a very good development of the crust with a light and low density crumb. Coloring of the crust is excellent, showing that typical leopard effect linked to a balanced fermentation. This result was achieved with the direct dough method with a 48 hour total fermentation time. Both the bulk fermentation and the final proofing folded cold fermentation in the fridge. And this is, by the way, one of the dough recipes for Neapolitan pizza that you can learn in my training.
We've come to the end of the technical analysis of fermentation. I really hope this video helped you better understand the theoretical and technical aspects behind fermentation. I strongly believe that understanding those theoretical notions is the first step towards mastering your dough. If you feel the need to go more into details about fermentation for your dough, I strongly recommend you look at my pizza training. All the information are here in the description. In this training, you will learn a methodology to master your dough and to reach quality, consistency and regularity. All of that with a technical and scientific approach, just like you saw in this video. The training will touch upon all the aspects of dough, including fermentation, and I will show you in a personalized way how to make sure all the variables are controlled correctly and how to get to a well-fermented dough. I'm Sergio, I'm a professional pizza trainer, and thanks for watching. Ciao e buona pizza!